Dooby Dooby Doo. That's what Frank Sinatra is saying. And that's the title, title of this sermon. We're supposed to be Christians, but we're also supposed to do what Christians are called to do. And this is, of course, that great message, faith without works is dead. So I hope you can listen and apply and use this message for your life. God bless you, and I look forward to meeting you when you come to First Presbyterian Church. Isn't it kind of hard to realize that it was only a week ago we had 4th of July? I mean, that was just last Sunday. We had, our, we had in fact, someone here, she's here today, started coming more recently. She said, I had a list of things that I wanted to do, and I don't know if this quite qualifies as my bucket list, but one thing I wanted to do was to go to a church picnic. So she came to our church picnic, and here we are, milling about, good-looking bunch, aren't we? And uh, had a great time there, the little ones. It was really, really fun. Uh, no... Uh, things worked out pretty well. We did notice that we had this barbecue with all these uh, briquettes in there, but we forgot letter fluid. So that was a bit of a challenge, um, but we managed to get some and got it going, and the burgers finally came off, and we had just a great time. And that was, so that was, of course, July 3rd. The next day, July 4, I had the chance to go out, Sydney and I had the chance to go out to the Nichol Nicholson's place at Fort Klamath, and uh, this, is, this is a little bit of dinner for us, uh, this fellow. They started him at 5 in the morning, and this is now about 7 or 8 at night. And it was just, it's just so beautiful out there. It was just amazing. It was wonderful. In fact, I was, um, Dave Fusell was out there, and he just kind of got there, and Bill said something and said, and now I'd like my pastor to, and I start praying, and Dave's like, whoa, Stuart's everywhere. Well, as it turns out, I guess I was. But we just had a wonderful, wonderful time out there. Great sense of being together. <clears throat> and now we come back one more time to hear from our friend James. I call this the school of James. It's not that easy to, to take all the lessons in, but he's got a lot to tell us. And he has a key lesson for us to consider. <clears throat> and you probably saw the signboard out there and said, I wonder what he's going to preach on today. Well, actually... What James is talking about has been a crux of Western philosophy ever since. There is a whole understanding of philosophy that talks about we need to realize who we are. You know the great Latin phrase, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. We need to know who we are and what we're about, and that becomes, and out of that comes the person that we, that our actions. But there's another side. The other side says that, that who you are are those things that you actually accomplish. They are the, the behaviorist side. And, and all this talk about who you are doesn't mean anything till we see what you do. So there has always been this battle between, in philosophy, between being and doing. And it wasn't until about the middle of the 20th century that a philosopher came along named Frank Sinatra, and he's saying, dooby, dooby, doo. That's it. That's it. I know what you're thinking. Preacher jokes. Can't stand them, but there they are. Can't get away from them. So this idea, shall we be or shall we do, has been one that has been around a long time. And James is firmly entrenched on the doing side. And we read him in James chapter 2 beginning at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and, and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? 
Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Pray with me. God, let us understand and apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. This, of course, is one of the great ideas in Scripture. And we've heard James build to this statement over the last two weeks. Two weeks, he says, don't just hear the word, do it. He sounded like a first century Nike commercial, did he not? Then last week, he said that practically speaking, that, that means we should not show favoritism. We should be even keel with each person, or as I perhaps suggested, uh, we should show favor to all. Now he brings it home with his strongest theological statement on this. He says, faith without works is dead. Now, as most of you know, the, this idea is actually debated within Scripture. Because if James is the proponent of faith without works is dead, then Paul could be considered the proponent of the opposite. Works without faith is dead. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And we'll talk more about this in our class following in the music room. I hope you'll join us. So wait a minute. Is it by grace we are saved, so I really shouldn't do anything? Or is it that only in my doing something that I prove that I'm actually saved? And I think it somewhat depends on how you look at people. The Apostle Paul saw his own tension at wanting to be a righteous person. And he tried to be righteous. And the more he tried, the more he saw how unrighteous he was. Romans 7 is one of the most tortured passages in Scripture. I'm, I'll read it to you. Uh, we know that this is Paul speaking about himself before he became a Christian. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it. It is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Now, if you had someone coming and talking to you and saying, I do not do what I want to do, but if I could do it, you'd say, man, you're kind of tied up in knots, aren't you, buddy? And he was. And that sets us up for the great eighth chapter of Romans. And in that chapter, it's like all of a sudden the doors open to the sky. The heavens are there. The Holy Spirit has come. God's love, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And his life now is absolutely open and committed to this wonderful devotion and service. So for him, a life of empty doing, of fulfilling the law without really knowing the heart of God, his very salvation was based on realizing 
the love and the grace of God first, and then acting in response to that grace. One writer called the Apostle Paul the apostle of the heart set free. And that view just thrills me. I hope it thrills you too. The idea that that now that we know God's love, we want to follow him rather than just trudging along doing what we think we must to please some unknown master in the sky. And we all want that. We all want to respond to the Lord out of love for all that he has done for us. And when you get a hold of that idea that, that God has absolutely forgiven you, that God truly loves you, and that he is committed to helping you walk in the spirit every day, that is a thrill. Now James, James looks at humanity a little differently. He thinks the problem is not so much that people feel they can't measure up to God, that they're not righteous. He thinks the problem, or at least a big problem, is that people are constantly trying to get away with doing less for God and getting credit for it. They want to claim the status of being godly without having to follow through. This does not apply to anyone here, of course, but there are people out in the world. And you might take umbrage at that. You might say, are you saying I'm not a Christian? I'll have you know, Pastor, that I believe in the Bible, I believe in Jesus, I believe he will come again, and I, will be I believe I will receive him in his glory. And I would say, I'm sure you do. James says the same thing. It's not that we don't believe, not at all. It's just like this guy over here. We have obligations that don't allow us the time to do the things we should. We're so busy with work, we don't have time to deal with the inconveniences people who actually need something and you know the kind of world we live in now when you call someone they say on their message machine don't leave a message just text me don't they I mean no time to actually listen to a whole darn message and the contract is we'll get along just great as long as you don't need anything from me and this is not a modern phenomena it's not something that arose with cell phones and and with computers Every generation has found a way to pay lip service to the faith while not living it out, including the Christians to whom James was, James was speaking then and the Christians to whom he is speaking now. And so James gives three examples that indicate that believing in and of itself is not enough. In fact, that kind of belief is dead. His first response when you say, I have the right belief, is that he looks down, looks down through the floor, looks down into hell itself. He says, you believe, huh? That is awesome. The demons in hell believe, and they're trembling in their boots. That's a paraphrase. I don't know if demons actually wear boots. I don't know where they buy them, but you get the idea. Believing in Christ is not the same as being a Christian. The difference between the demons and us is not whether they believe in God, but by their actions, they have declared whose side they are on, and they work for the other side. The question is, how about you? If someone took a movie of your life, of the actions that happen in your daily existence, Whose side would they think you are on? As the great old question goes, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And here's one of the further challenges from our text. James is saying, and it needs to be a silent movie. You can't get credit for praying for a parking place and that kind of thing. It's what they see you do in your actions. So would they, would they show that you care? Would they show that you are living out the faith by trying to help someone, by being generous with your time or your treasure, by truly hearing someone else? Now, I'll tell you, I see this kind of faithfulness all the time here at FPC. A young mom who has her own kids and plenty to do takes in foster babies to give them a chance, not for the money. They don't need the money. It's not convenient. 
but she does it to try to impact those young lives. A man in our church goes to nursing homes and, and leads a Bible study. It's not that fun going into nursing homes, as some of you know. Some of you live there. But he wants to be there and to do this for them. Many of you lend money that you know will never be returned. And quietly and honorably, you offer a hand of grace to people around you. There are some wonderful silent movies coming out of this church. But all of us in our mental editing room have to ask, what does the silent film of my life show? He goes from the demons to the patriarchs to prove that faith without works is dead. And his example is Abraham. Abraham has lived his long life under the glory and then became the shadow of his promise. And the promise was that you will have descendants that are as numerous as the stars in the sky. The problem was he had nothing. And as he got older, he decided maybe he could help God out. So uh, there was a child with he and Hagar. That wasn't the plan. And we know the wonderful story. These, these angels, these beings would come and approach him and they say, you're, you and Sarah, you're going to have a child. And what does Sarah do? She starts giggling in the tent. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. You know? And the, this great little exchange in the, in the Bible, the, the angel said, they go to Sarah and say, you laughed. She goes, puckers up. No, I didn't. Oh, but you did. And so this child is born. And Wells, could they name the child? But Isaac, laughter. And he was the delight of their lives. He was the great, not only the great promise, he was a great kid. And then the terrible news comes. Abraham, you need to sacrifice this child. And who could ever ask a parent to do such a thing? And yet Abraham goes, and his arm goes up, and his hand with his knife is stayed. And Isaac goes on to be that fulfillment of the promise. Now, what's the message? The message is, in light of that, in light of that kind of obedience... Don't you think what you and I are being asked to do is somewhat small potatoes? We aren't being asked to sacrifice a child. We are being asked to give a moment. We're being asked to care a little more, to love someone who is difficult. We do it because we are called by Christ. We do it because we understand that part of faith is sacrifice. It is putting ourselves second or third or fourth. It has given the other person more of a break than normal. And if Abraham seems a high bar, I mean, he is the patriarch, maybe we could go a little lower. How about Rahab? Rahab doesn't get an A rating on the list of spiritual, you know, characters. I mean, she is, their term would be a heathen prostitute. That can't be, you know, awesome. But she believed that there was something of God in these strangers that came there. And against all odds, against her, her connection with her own people, against her, uh, her own profession for that matter, all the other things, she said, I think God is in this. And so by faith she took them in, by faith she sent them in another way where they were not captured. And once again we see the comparison. Is it as hard for us to do God's will as it was for her? I don't think so. I think we tend to get so involved in our schedule and our priorities that it seems nearly impossible to do anything more or anything different. How could we possibly make some space to love someone else? And yet, if Rahab can do all that, I'll bet we can welcome a stranger now and again. I'll bet we can provide some financial support. I'll bet we can bless others. The point is, our faith needs to show itself in acts of obedience, in love, in what the Bible calls works. Let me get a little drink here. You saw the pictures of our picnic. I heard a great story about our picnic last week. There's a fellow named Tom Sims who comes to our church. He sits right about there. Uh, he's not here today, but he gave me permission to share the story. So he came to our picnic, or what he thought was our picnic, 
he goes to the park. He, he said, I, I went home, and I got, he was really proud of it. I got this bunt cake. It's a great big bunt cake with little bunt cakes around it, and it's iced in red, white, and blue. And he was coming to the park. So he comes to the park. But unfortunately, he went to a different section of the park. And he got there, and he thought, is this the church or not? He couldn't quite tell. You know, he hasn't been here that long. And it could be. And so he thinks it is. So he gets out of his car. And, oh, welcome, welcome. And he has the cake. And he kind of is still testing this theory whether or not it's the church. He says, uh, where, where does the food go? Oh, over there. And so he goes over there. He's about the only dessert. Other people have salads and all that sort of thing. He said he noticed some people playing volleyball. And he said, you know, I'm, I don't mean to be too... Uh, prudish, but they seem to be dressed a little skimpily for a church event, but, uh, you know, whatever. And he noticed a few more neck tattoos than he thought we had, but he goes, well, anymore, you never know, you know. Finally, someone got, a bit, someone got up to speak, and he realized, oh, I'm at the 20th annual celebration of Al-Anon. Here we are. But here's something he told me. He said he couldn't get over how friendly people were. I mean, they were so nice. And I just preached on that topic of don't show favoritism, if you'll remember. And he thought, wow, people really took Pastor Stewart's message to heart. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, let your good works so shine before others they might, let your light so shine before others they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I suppose a modern day paraphrase of that would be, let your light so shine before others, they might mistake you for an Al-Anon meeting. I'm sure that if Tom had found our spot, he would, have, he would have experienced warm fellowship and a gracious spirit of acceptance there as well. But the Lord, through James, keeps challenging us. And I don't like this any more than you do. Don't just be a Christian. Do what Christians do. So the question is, can we do a little better? Can we be a little warmer? Can we be a little more open? Can we be a bit more giving? I think so. Or at least let me say, I know I can. How about you? As we go to prayer, let me say we're, you know, it's the middle of the summer and that becomes the low part of our income so we're down a little and if uh, you are behind thank you for catching up and if you want to add a little more I appreciate that too let us pray Lord God we are each of us those who are Christians and those who are trying to be Christians and do what you have called us to do and so be with us that we might do it better. Do it as you would have us do it. Do it more completely. And now, God, as we give of our resources, use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing with us. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. All praise to Christ Jesus in His only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Now let's all go out in this world and show them that, in fact, we are Christians by the way that we love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said,